Um, we're going to talk about, guess what, building complex sites. Um, the objective is to share experience or I wouldn't even say best practices, that would be very conceited to think that we have the best practices, but at least some experiences of how we deal with complex projects. Um, I'm going to try to make it as much about Joomla as I can. The thing is, doing complex projects isn't about technology most of the time. But what we will try to do as we get along into the presentation, show you some practical tips of how we do Joomla projects. This is stuff we learned from customers that we discovered along the way, stuff we inherited from other technologies. And if you feel that you have a good idea to present in some area that we're talking about, feel free to raise your hand and share how you address a certain situation in a particular way. What do we mean by a complex site? Because that's a silly question to start with because you're all here to hear about complex sites. What do you think is complex? Let me hear some ideas of what complexity is to you as an audience. Lots of components, yeah. Tens of thousands of articles. Large sites, lots of volume. Oh, big structure. Yep. Oh, category sections. Content structure. A, a client who wants a large site but doesn't understand technology. Yep. Integration with some other external applications. Great. You guys. Who doesn't know what they actually want. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Good. Well, that concludes my presentation. <laughs> no. My first challenge was, was how do you in, how do you write an introduction for a presentation on how to deal with complex projects? I got the first question, what's a complex site? I'm like, okay, so far so good. Do you have a picture? That's not a kid, which is good. Um, so what do we have as complex? Migrations from other CMSs. Oh, we have this big corporate site. It was built 15 years ago. It's got 30,000 articles. The company just went bankrupt, and we need a new one. Um, we have a big customer meeting three weeks from now. Could you migrate it to Joomla? Sites with a very complex content structure. We have tons of different types of document with different rights and different presentations and different structures, and we need to organize them, and different departments have workflows that have to do with legal reviews and translations. Sites that are more applications. We want to build the ultimate site where you can book travel, uh, put pictures of your dog, and then have somebody come to your house and watch the dog while you go to Haiti. And share friends who have similar dogs and you know, give you a daily message on your phone how your dog is doing. Integrations with other sites or other systems. Um, I'm not talking WordPress RSS feeds, I'm talking ERP systems, uh, inventory control systems, uh, CRM systems, uh, mainframes, a um, bunch of Excel files stored on a central server somewhere. Anything with vague requirements. Who's been in a project with vague requirements? <laughs> okay, the, for the others, the art class is in another room. <laughs> okay. Vague requirements is a combination of two things. Either you don't know what people want, or they don't know yet, but there's no time to figure it out before you need to complete it. And most of the time, it's both. Or building things you've never done before. The biggest mess-ups I've seen are people's first big Joomla projects, or big whatever projects. Which brings me back to migrations from other CMSs. Migrations from other vendors. Have, have you ever had customers who ask you, we have this Joomla site built by X, we don't like them anymore, could you please take it over and get a legacy? Yeah, okay, good. You're in the right room. Customer issues that make it complex. I mean, on the customer side, you've got lack of skills. Oh, we want this site to show everything which is an inventory in real time. We don't want people to log in, but it has to be personalized. <laughs> Low process maturity. We want a new product catalog. We are at a fair, we want to present it. We want lots of pictures. Yeah, so where's the, where's the picture and who's going to make them? Well, that's your job, right? 
You, may, you build a site. Do we have to give you pictures and product information? Come on. Unrealistic expectations. Oh, we, we want to build something which is sort of like Facebook, um, and, and we want it to be 0.1 second response time for the, the, the 500,000 members we'll have in six months, and then it has to scale up. And we'll pay you when we get advertisers. Yeah, very complex requirements. Uh, you need to be able to, on the fly, translate documents into 15 Asian languages for travel applications to countries that don't exist yet, but then you can form your own country and then... <laughs> Poor communication coordination. Um, there's a project manager, but he's being fired and uh, he can only meet with you on May 17th in 2011, when we still have him in for a week to fix issues. And the other project manager would like to talk to you, but he only speaks Vietnamese. And uh, budget issues, you know? Oh, yeah, we, uh, we don't have budget issues. Uh, actually, no, let me rephrase. We don't have a budget. <laughs> Timeline issues. Uh, when can you finish it? You know, the sooner the better. Or we can do it in two months. Oh, we need it next week. Or lack of a strategic perspective. Um, we want a spoon. Bill us a spoon. Well, what do you want to do? I, I, I'm asking for a spoon. I need it now. Build a spoon. Well, this is no good. I can't cut my meat with this. Well, you should have asked for a knife. What's a knife? Where, if you told me you weren't going to start a restaurant, I would have sold you plates. Well, that's your job, right? Any of you built this site before I go on? <laughs> Good. It's a UK company. Anyone from the UK here? Welcome. Um, they were really, this, it's a company that does a lot of graphics work for this customer and decided to make a website and they said, ah, Joomla, nice. Shouldn't, shouldn't be too difficult. It was their first ever Joomla site. They said, wow, two months tops, well, nine months later, uh, they were uh, quite a bit over budget and it was, this was really badly coded. I mean, really badly coded. One example, one that will probably be in my book of classics, they needed to put a form on the website. How do you do that in Joomla? Well, you create an article, you go to the HTML button of the editor and you put an HTML code for the form. But of course, if you save that, your HTML editor will filter out some of the tags. So you switch off the HTML editor. Otherwise, customers always fuck up the, the forms in the articles, right? Then the customer says, this Joomla thing is really hard to, I mean, wh why do our authors have to learn HTML to put in an article? Wh what? Well, look. So, well, what did you do with the HTML editor? What HTML editor? It was switched off. That's what I mean by lack of skills and first project, okay? Oh, please, can you fix this? But the customer's expectations were set all wrong. They had a bad Joomla experience. They were negative from the get-go. They had little technical knowledge. And they had a very unclear process. These are all the requirements we could gather from the seven people that have anything to do with this site. Could you make a site out of this? Have you discussed this with each other? <laughs> You're kidding. This is communication department, we're IT, we don't talk to them. Hmm? No one, okay. <laughs> this is a positive example, one that went really well but was challenging. This is an international organization for, that assists migra migrants in returning on a voluntary basis. So if they decide that I came here from Ghana and it's not working out, I'd like to go back, they get assistance explanation. Uh, they had this 25-year anniversary of the program, the big academic session, all European ministers and you know, lots of political attention. They needed a big website to present the results. They needed it in five weeks from now. Um, well, write the content. Don't worry. It'll be ready. <laughs> and then there's a new IT boss that says, where's the milestone plan? Like, dude, this is a five-week project. You run projects without milestones? I used to run mil million dollar SAP implementations. Every project needs milestones. I need milestones, so this project is not moving forward. Mm, that was not an easy project, but we finished it, didn't we? Absolutely. <laughs> so in general, when we look at a project, we, we try to structure everything we do in a project in a number of areas where we try to put complexity, tie that to something really 
specific, not this is a difficult project, but it has to do with the architecture. Um, we're going to need lots of different components and technical setup. It has to do with a complex navigation. You've got many different types of customers or visitors and you want to give them a really good experience. I'm sorry if I'm not looking at you all the time, but I have a mobility issue here. The visual design, uh, content, the functionality, other integration issues, operational parameters, speed, size, hosting, volume, and the process that's going to receive the tool and maintain it going forward from content management to updating the site to support issues, first line, second line. All of these areas are like a common thread in how we work with customers. We always use these areas as a way to categorize items, categorize discussions. When we have a meeting, it's about one of these topics, not five of them. Handling complexity. The blue pill is for the people who want to attend the art class. There is no complex, non-complex project. If you find one, let me know. I will come watch and watch until you change your mind and discover that it is, because you will. So treat every project like a complex project. Be, uh, be on the lookout for risk and complexity because you're going to find it. Get to know your customer. Um, many of us technology guys and girls, well, you can drop the many if it's girls, but still, uh, we, we don't work with customers all that well. You know? um, if you want to get effective communication going to understand what the customer wants, you need to listen and then listen and then listen. Um, and observe how they do business. Watch them in meetings, how they interact with each other see what they are comfortable with in ways of dealing with people and create and this is this is probably like uh, soft soft mellow stuff but it has to be some level of respect if you find a company that treats suppliers like trash walk away uh, you need to be able to have factual discussions more often than not the customers internal politics stand in the way of that and you need to be focused on your customer success not yours because you can only be successful if your customer is successful. These are, these are some things I've tried and I can, I've proven that they work. You can start a relationship by talking about yourself and you're sure to mess it up. The first half hour of a first meeting, talk about what you've done, where you went to school. I, I have flashbacks to a keynote speaker. But. Um, make sure you demo your biggest accomplishments. Dazzle the customer, you know. Talk about technology. Talk about the difference between 1.5 and 1.0 and the architecture, the framework, and all the components and you know, all the technical stuff, plugins and modules and templates and overrides. It's very important for a customer. Do not talk about budget and timeline. That'll, that'll sort itself out. You know, just, um, do, never talk about what happens when the site is live. You know? Uh, we had a sales training once from a, a British guy who called us the, the, the 3F strategy, find, fuck, and forget. <laughs> Do never challenge the customer's requirements. I want the menu to be circular. Circular. Assume content will be available on time. That's logical. And where do you mess up a project? When you're selling it. You have to start your sales phase uh, as if this is the project. If you start off on the wrong foot, it's like a nail that you hammer into a piece of wood and you put it like that. You're never going to get it straight. Uh, so you need to establish a correct sequence of events. This is also a sales strategy term. A sequence of events is the consecutive number of things you need to do before you can close the deal. You need to lay that out for the customer and say, we're going to do this and this and this and this, and then we will have a contract that we can sign. Um, we have this structure for quotes, we use it all the time. Um, it's, it's sometimes repetitive, but it's very useful. We start with the background. I mean, sometimes that's five lines. This is IBM who wants a, uh, who wants a website for this and that. What's the problem? Uh, we currently have three sites in different technologies. We want to unite them and want to be able to show video. 
How will you fix it? What's the solution principle? We will build one single Joomla instance and we will use a media server using this technology. We'll integrate that that way. What do you need to do to make it happen? This is a statement of work. We will need to build a Joomla site. We will need to get content. We need to visual design. We will need to build the media server, load the media on that, test that out, do a prototype run, test the infrastructure for bandwidth, and then roll it out. What is that going to take? Effort, cost, licenses, machines, whatever. Financial offer, obviously. And how will you do business? The last one seems like a simple thing. It is actually not. This is standing in front of the altar and you're marrying a customer and the priest says, for good times and bad times, and the guy goes like, well, I'm not sure about the bad times, but can you strike that from the contract? <laughs> it is actually pretty interesting to do this up front. You know, don't do a bottom-up calculation of how many hours you will spend to end up with a fixed price budget. Try to establish those ground rules from the beginning. Okay, you sold the deal. Congratulations, by the way. Um, don't do something heroic. Um, don't do big bank projects, or try not to do big bank projects. There is a number of tried and tested techniques like prototyping, pilots, conference room pilots, phase rollouts, one department and then five more and then 20 more. If the customer gives you one big lump sum budget, split it. Work with them to divide this into first phase, et cetera, et cetera. Keep some money behind for unexpected stuff. And be very clear on go, no go milestones. Tell them that we're going to do the pilot phase and then we're going to reevaluate your budget. If we think it's going to be 50K and we do a 10K pilot phase, uh, we may come out that the 40K left is not enough. So if for budgeting, we're about 30% variance. So you need to take 65 into your budget. We still think it's 50, but in 10K from now, we will tell you whether it's 35 or 55. Be upfront about that. If you do a cleanup job, you inherit somebody's code or somebody's attempted coding, be very careful. Fix one issue at a time. You know this, this series where they try to put somebody's leg back on, a collapsed lung, heart surgery and brain surgery all in one 50-minute episode on TV? That doesn't work in real life. You know, one thing at a time. You're going to kill the patient if you're not careful. So don't upgrade Joomla and make it multilingual and restructure the content and move to a new hosting provider in the same time under time and budget pressure. That is, unless you're masochistic. In which case, you can call me. I've got some freelance jobs for you. Never let budget and time constraints rush you. If you need to do that, walk away from the job. I mean, you know this phrase that if something is worth doing, it is worth doing well? Well, this is a good application of it. You know, if, if you are under situations for the risky project, don't accept any more relatively artificial uh, constraints. Or if you do, be very upfront with the customer that this is going to be an additional burden on you. Blah, 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 define, you know, good process, good documentation, structured approach. Who uses a project methodology or some form of document that explains how you will work with a customer? Good. You need to write down or document or convey in some form or shape how your process will work, what you will be working on in which phase, what will be the focus of attention during those phases, how it will be different, because you need to mobilize resources from your customer that are different in each of these phases. Um, this is a piece of Dutch text, my apologies, but I wanted to show you pretty much how we, how we have a one-page document that we talk over with customers in about 10 minutes and they understand it. This goes like, okay, we've got the process, the operations, the integration, the functional, the content, and these are analysis, design, implementation, and rollout. And these are the center questions of that aspect of the project in that phase. When we're talking about content in the analysis phase, we talk about what's the logical structure of content in your world? What does it look like? What should it look like? When we're implementing it, we're building the, inf the content structure, the categories, the sections, and the articles, and we're, we're put, bringing in the content. That is part of the work we do. 
Now that's in English, well it's in Dutch, but it's in common language, it's not in technicalese. There's probably not much of a Joomla specific term in there, because your customer doesn't know Joomla. Uh, in our quotes, we use the same structure, you know, content, visuals, navigation, architecture, process, the four phases. We do a bottom-up analysis of how much time it will take, and then we bring it up. Most important phases, analysis and design. What percentage of, of the effort of a web project should be spent in analysis and design? Who, who thinks it's 50% or more? Who thinks it's less than 30%? Who hasn't got a clue what I'm talking about? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there's no golden rule, but 30% uh, is definitely on the low side, and 50% for web projects is probably about right. If it gets more complex, you can spend 70% of the time talking about what you're going to build. And here's, my pun and here's my commercial line for today. Of course, with K2, you don't need to analyze and design. No, another, fifty, another 50 bucks in my pocket. Uh, analysis means you try to understand in detail what the customer wants. Of course, you've written a contract that says we're going to build this solution, but now you have, you have to flesh it out in great detail. So the best thing to do is develop a common terminology, which is stepping into their world and understanding what they're talking about. Who starts the project with an introduction to Joomla? Could you please stop doing that? Does your customer really? I mean, you're, this is like saying, okay, we're gonna do a discussion about a very important thing for you in Mandarin Chinese. Let me give you a quick introduction to Mandarin Chinese. Now you explain in Mandarin Chinese to me what you want. Ha! Huh. They don't know Joomla enough to, to and, and they're doing your job then. Don't try to make it easier for yourself. I'm looking at you, I'm sorry, I'm not picking on you, but. We make this mistake, because it's easier for you to understand me if I explain what my world is. Well, turn it around. Get into their world. It's actually the most interesting part of a project is to learn how people's world, worlds look like and not to teach them Joomla. Anything is good. Sketches, flip charts, uh, video recordings, audio recordings, Word documents, PowerPoints, anything that helps clarify what you're talking about is good. There's no um, technology that you should bar from that. Design, on the other hand, is not about what they want, but what you will build. It's, this is the part that you elaborate how you will con what you will construct as a solution in detail. You have to document that. I mean, you can sit and talk with customers for a long time to understand it, but when it comes to designing something, you need to document it, because they need to sign off on that. If they don't understand what you're, what you're going to be building, well, go back to the design table. This is why you need a, a factual, trustworthy relationship. You need your customer to feel comfortable saying, okay, great presentation. I have no clue what you just told me. Could you please explain again? It sounds great. Don't, don't move them into a position where they say, I didn't understand what you were going to build, but you were so enthusiastic and I like you so much. I just said, okay, not good. Um, Analysis and design of navigation. So one of these topics in the stack is navigation. Um, we usually start off with a discussion, sort of an open discussion, says, well, who should visit the site? Try to um, give me a stereotype of your typical visitor. Age, interest, uh, relationship you have with them, what they're looking for, what they will find interesting to, f to, to, to see. Mind maps work really well with that. There's some very good um, open source free mind mapping tools. Uh, XMind, FreeMind, that we use quite a bit. Because you can put topics in a tree and rearrange them. And in the beginning, people throw some topics. Oh, we need to, they need to download documents, they need to find forms, they need to register for events, they need to do this, we need to, you know, general conditions have to be there, we need to have news, we need, we need to have press releases. And then as you discuss further about 
target groups and interesting content, you move these into branches and your center is the site and the next layer is the target groups and then slowly emerges the navigation. You can see here, this is the site, this is the top level navigation which is the main, the main ar arrows on the site for migrants, for partners and about the project and then who the, these are sort of menu items. Now this is where Joomla is really good with mind maps. Most of these things, you know, when you get to target groups and that, you'll find menu items there. That's your primary source of a menu item, which is very easy to detect. You can use Excel or Calc if you're an open office person. To translate this further into detail, you, you need to give the customer some homework. Not because you don't want to do the work, but because they need to buy into this structure. They need to work with it themselves. So what we do is we list all the items, all the uh, menu items uh, in the level that they're in. You can use an indented form as well. And we said, these are all the things you told me people need to find on the site. And next to it, you start mapping that to, when you click on this, what do you want to see? I want just one article. Do you want a list of articles? Do you want a component? Do you want functionality? Do you want the blog? Do you want the map? So you, you start mentally driving them through the mind map to the navigation to discover if you click on this menu, I want to see a list of content items of a certain type. And that gets evolved with the other columns and allows you to build a men what we call a menu mockup. It's the same menu structure they see in the mind map, but in actual menu items that in general all point to one article that says Lorem Ipsum Dolo Sit Ahmed. Right? But they can navigate that and they go with the mind map, they go with the Joomla, so they go like, hey! <laughs> we did not teach them about menus and modules and but they understand that. And the trick we do is we, when we build those menu items, we, we, if this is like a FAQ, we write star FAQ. All the menu items that we haven't finished yet are preceded by a star, which gives them an excellent way of seeing how far along in the project you are. They need to complete content, great. So they can say, I've done this menu item today, I take off the star and everybody sees that there's progress. Really easy, I mean. Who uses wireframes for visual design? <coughs> Who has never used wireframes but knows what wireframes are? That was me a year ago. I go like, oh, wireframes, great technique. No clue how I'm going to do that. Let me look for tools. What? That's expensive. Ah. Then we came across this nice little tool called Wireframe Sketcher and Eclipse. It's a brilliant piece of work. Um, wireframes are uh, you can do this on paper and pencil. We actually often do that because it's quicker. Um, in the first phases, you just draw on paper. Take A4 papers, landscape, not a draw. Or print just a browser outline with some grids. Or use, of the, use some of Sander's great Joomla community.eu write pads, which have like pixelized lines. You can actually draw on that very easily, which is a great, great thing. And you just build a few pages and you start doing this interactively with the customer if you can. The fun thing about this is that it works really well with Joomla because all of the elements that you put on a screen is like a menu or a block or an image. It's all, it's a module, it's a component and it, it really, the breakdown of your mind map, the mind map that is behind that, the structure of your wireframe becomes your list of modules and stuff, which is really good because when you complete that by doing sessions with your customer, printing out paper version of that in black and white, and then drawing on that or cutting out other pieces and pasting them together. You know this, this post-it style spray where you can peel off things? Really good for, great, for big sessions with non-technical users. You see, this is one example of the wireframe we had. And this is the visual design for that. You see the similarity? Well, the customer did so too. That doesn't mean you stop there. Then we look at this and we go like, okay, we got the structure right, but it doesn't really look good. And then the customer says, let's evolve this because they don't like the white space here and this is sort of floating uh, and, and we want this a little bit different and we want a big picture here. That's the purely visual stuff, but the structure is done. Why is that important? You've got your work for modules, components, menus laid out. You can start building that while you're still assembling this at the template level. Try doing that in Drupal. Good luck. That's, that's where the architecture, the block structure of Joomla is extremely interesting. 
Same goes for analysis and design. Um, have you ever done one of these, like writing down the structure of the, of the data and the relationships between things with your customer? Yeah, well, you don't count, of course. We did it together, so. <laughs> this is actually really important, guys, it really. I mean, this is getting into the customer's world, understanding what they're talking about. Don't go like, oh, you want to sell houses? Well, I need a category called houses. Oh, you need apartments and houses. I need a section called houses and one apartments and houses underneath. And you've got press, whatever, actuality, press, blog. You don't blog, do you? No, no blog. Uh, here, here's the content structure. I'll start building that. And when you can send me content, Word document, I'll put that in. <sighs> Not really the best way of doing this. The problem is that Joomla really doesn't help you in this. For most people, Joomla is articles. And you have sections and categories. The paradigm we use with people is like, an article is a piece of paper, a category is a binder, and a section is a cabinet. You, know, you can put multiple binders into a cabinet, but a page can only be in one binder. So you have to be careful where you put it. Then they understand. It's still a pretty lame analogy, but it works for customers. The problem with content is it's a matter of semantics. When a customer talks about a house that they're trying to sell, or a course that they're organizing. To them, it's a really live object. They have all kinds of associations in their head, which you lack because you're not in their world. But when you look at everything from the perspective of a, of a hammer guy, all you'll find is nails. And then you'll do something which is very logical when you talk about carpentry, but not to the customer. And you lose them. It's just the way it is. Here's an example of a pretty big site uh, this is a consortium of nonprofits in Belgium working in the south, I mean the, the Dutch speaking ones. Uh, I think it's about seven and a half thousand articles, about 48 countries for something like 80 organizations, uh, 35 topics, 170 individual uh, like dossiers, um, about 3,000 job openings and about 18,000 use items from organizations, right? It was a Mambo site, you know, way, way back in the good old time. The core was hacked extensively because, well, I'll show you in the next slide why, you know, they wanted an upgrade to 1.5 and, and, and uncluster fuck the code. We spent three weeks going through the site and the database trying to figure out how it worked. We, let, we had to look at the code, which was not fun. So what's on the page? What's the structure that I see here semantically? And then what's the data? Whoa, where is this in the database? Conclusion, everything is an article. The hammer and nail paradigm. Countries are categories and articles are articles. And an article is, in, go, is about a country. Now you talk about a president who has escaped from Congo to Ghana. And that's about two countries, damn. A, don't write the article. B, copy the article and forget that you have a copy. Or C, put an article in multiple categories. You can't do that in Joomla, you couldn't even do it in Mambo, but you can hack the code, right? And the same goes for theme. Themes are categories, and an, an article is about two themes in three countries. <sighs> Some of you actually saw the Mambo code for content. Imagine adding this, this was fun. This is what the customer gave us. After three weeks, we validated that this is the content structure. Yeah, laugh away. But actually, this is the content structure. This is how they see the world. That's what you need to build. Anything else you build, flatten that to articles and categories and binders and cabinets, and you will lose them. The end users, and there's about 350 of them, people with no technical knowledge who enter content for organizations that are a member of the consortium, they need to be able to do that. Content translation, well, flatten it into com content, everything's an article, good. Good for small things, you talked about large content structures or complex structures, doesn't work. Build your own components, build com house and com apartment and com whatever, and keep building. We, we did an estimate for a project. We, we ended up building 18 different 
custom content components, approximately two days a pop when they were finished with views and everything. And then they change the specs and then they change the other stuff. You keep writing code and messing with code. Not a very pleasant thing. You can use a CCK extension, um, which is an approach that might work. It's still content projection. It's just a richer projection than com content. Or you can use one content, which is my personal commercial pitch for my presentation tomorrow. When you do migrations, uh, has anyone ever done migrate? I'm not talking upgrades from 1.0 to 1.5, although they can be painful, but say from Typo 3 to Joomla, or from uh, an all-star CMS. Sorry? Zope. Zope. <laughs> oh, I need a drink. Um, anyone done migrations? Yeah? Aren't they fun? Another example, about 4,500 articles, 800 um, countries and topics together. An old style CMS, uh, sort of uh, first generation style, every menu, hierarchical menus, every menu has a template and you can put a module in the right column of a template for a particular menu, but then you have to repeat this in 50 menu items if you want a type or three style thing. Um, Oh, these guys went bankrupt. They're looking for a new investor, but we're not going to wait around for that. Here's the data dump. We'll get a new, an, a new one when you're ready, so you'll have to sync it again with the live site. But, but can you start working on this? Is there any documentation? Nope. Can we get the software from these guys to run the local copy? We don't want to tell them you're working on a new version, so no. <sighs> can you start doing this now? Like, here's the data. <laughs> <laughs> on top of that, you look at the site with the customer, he goes like, yeah, no, before, before you actually translate it, we're going to clean it up. So you get a data dump of a menu structure, you compare that to the live site, you don't find the menu item. So you call them and go like, I don't understand this. Oh yeah, but we've removed a lot of the menu items because we don't need them anymore. So we're cleaning it up. So what do we compare this ASCII file set with? Oh. <laughs> We forgot. Should we ask for another data dump? No, thank you. These were uh, about 180 files like this. This is front base. Any guys familiar with this? This is a Mac database export format. They claim to be ANSI SQL 92, which is, I was 30 in 92, but I don't remember ever talking about this. So you get IDs, you get codes, you get some data structure, but you have no clue what's, what the meaning is. So you have to reverse engineer that. Um, so we build a tool, we build a script. And we try to load the menu items into Joomla with the same structure. And look at the Joomla setting and go like, <laughs> this doesn't look like the site. Let's have this. Oh yeah, this is the relationship. Let's change the script, run it again. What's the fun part about this? We did this for the 11.b site as well. You run the script about 150 times while you're implementing. And your live site goes on, it changes and it goes on and people just manage that update, put news in it. And the last weekend before you go live, you run the script the final time. And by magic, you copy all the content in the right place with all the exceptions and all the menus and the articles and the authors and the published times and everything is copied because you spend 25% of your time building that tool. That saves a lot of frustration. You spend three days doing a manual copy, and you go like, oh, here's a new update. <laughs> yes, it is worth investing a week to write that script. Seriously, it is worth it. Murphy says, you want to go live on Monday, which is a bad idea anyway, um, or on Friday, even better. Always go live before a big holiday or before a weekend. It's just what are the odds that the production side will go down the day you're preparing to go live with the new one? High. Yeah, it happens. So um, you have like a one hour window to do the, the content conversion. <laughs> it's good to have a script like that. It's actually fun to see it push it over. Uh, isn't that nice? I mean, that's a nice picture, isn't it? A little bit uh, weird. Are you challenged? <laughs> 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 
okay, is this weird or is he weird? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, this is a, an interesting case of, um, of starting small and evolving. This is a customer who says we want to do this site where the, the union of bicycle owners and drivers in Belgium, we want to promote cycling, so we would do this bike to work thing. People who drive their bike to work, we're going to give them an environment. Every day they can go in and say, I've driven to work, and they can earn points, and they get vouchers with, with they can win a, a bike, or they can win a, like a bell or a light or a helmet or maybe a weekend trip or a book with nice way, places to go drive your bike and they can get their own login and they get their like bicycle degrees like how what percentage of your travel you actually bike and compare yourself with others and all together how many kilometers did we do i think they've gone about uh, 118 times around the world already since a year and a half ago when they started so it's lots of personalization and we want to do companies that can pay for their employees and they can do teams one, one month a year, they can do teams and sort of have a competition and they can get statistics and they get exports, et cetera, et cetera. We want to do a lot of invoicing on that. So we said, this is great. A lot of data you want to pull out, Sugar CRM does that. So we put the backend data entirely in Sugar CRM. All the operational stuff's in Sugar CRM. It's not even in Joomla. Joomla has the content and the banners and the images, but that's about it. And the user logins, which we synchronize. This is the last three months. They said, we're going to have about uh, roughly about 1,000 users, 1,200 or so after a year, year and a half. That would be really great. They went from February this year from about 2,500 visitors per week to about 10,000 per week in three months because they got some relatively large companies on board. Now, if you know Sugar CRM, you have, you're integrating with a SOAP interface, which isn't the lightest interface in the world. Um, and pretty much all the content is personalized for this person. You know, so there's hardly any opportunity for caching modules or anything. Um, you can see that the load goes up if the number of visitors go up. You have to imagine we're up to about 7,000 users. And what these people do is once a day, Typically once a day, I mean a small portion does it once a week. Most of them, we've done a, a survey. Most of them, when they come into the office in the morning, they go online, they click, I took my bike to work or I took my car to work. So in about an hour and a half window, 7,000 people or 6,000 people go online. Now we're running this on this huge server, Pentium 5 with two gig. Um, it's not a problem yet. But, if you can see a trend here, it is going to be a problem soon. Which is why we sold them a big hosting uh, contract. But if you want to achieve scalability, including the one that you didn't think was going to be necessary, uh, build layer upon layer of decoupling. Build it in separate, nice, architectural, isolated blocks. So that every block has a clear function and you can make it stronger, bigger, faster without impacting the interface with the ones above and the ones below. This is software engineering 100, but still, it helps to encapsulate the caching. Like we have these records of every day, John had on the 3rd of January did seven miles and then the 4th did this. If you want to run statistics and averages, you know, this database becomes huge about, you know, all these records for people who've been on this for a year and a half, 7,000 people, keeps growing. At some point, we did journaling. We started to condense anything which is older than two months into a monthly average. So when we do this calculation, it's not a single query, it's a number of queries, and actually we cache that for 24 hours because we know it typically doesn't change. But that happens on a functional level where, it, where you profile your application, well, this takes three seconds. If we change this function to do different things or do it in a different way, it becomes 0 0.03 seconds. Now, this is interesting. Let's change that. But only that function. Now, you can only do that if you've designed it well. And this is a repetitive process. This is like bottleneck basics. When you fix a bottleneck, something else becomes the bottleneck. And then something else and something else, which is good because then you can keep working for your customer and building them. Did I say that out loud? I did. But sometimes, you know, it just breaks down. It, it, it becomes a step change. You cannot do what you need to do with a small modification. You need a, a revolutionary step. Um, in this case, we're going to dump Sugar CRM. 
There's nothing wrong with Trigger CRM, by the way, but the customer's not really using the backend as they thought they were going to. Uh, so we use Trigger CRM as a, as a sort of a big, slow database. And we're going to change that. We did a first change. Instead of reading through the SOAP interface, we read directly from the database and we write through the SOAP interface. That sped it up massively. Because when SOAP, Sugar Serum, you have a SOAP interface, and you want one record, you get all of the metadata for that SPOP and then the data, which is like 80% overhead. If you read from the database, it's faster. But you need to write through the interface to do all the business lo logic, the mapping and, the, and the, the hooks in there. But if we don't use the functionality, we can now rewrite this layer again and just use the database. But the website doesn't really know that it's in Sugar CRM. It just sees data coming back. Uh, this sounds like uh, something special for big, complex projects. It will happen that your customer says, uh, I, you've got this video plugin, or this uh, image gallery, or this newsletter module. And I wanted to do this and this and this. And you go like, oh, damn it. This is the one feature that this one I've installed doesn't have. Have you ever had to do that, replace an image gallery, or a form component, or a newsletter component, an extension, buy another one, and rework a lot of shit to get it done because it's encrusted in modules and plugins and... Well, it's your own fault. Um, you should have prepared for it. You can never prepare completely, but it's similar for something very s simple like uh, all videos plug in that has to replace something else or for an architectural component like you know, where your database is or how you drive content in every night. I'm actually at the end. Are you still with me? <laughs> right. Um, the, the biggest thing I need to tell you is, is don't panic. I was going to do a Douglas Adams quote, but uh, actually I was going to show a Kabouter Wesley video, but I have no internet here. Who knows Kabouter Wesley? I urge you to look up Kabouter Wesley on, on YouTube. Um, it's in Dutch, but you'll appreciate the humor anyway. Pretty graphical. <laughs> But, but it's not just because it's fun and Belgian, but it, because there's a story. You know, take it lightly. Uh, it's only a project, and it's, it's a good attitude to be able to step back from what you're doing and go like, oh, this isn't right. Let's do it differently. Um, you need to, the best way to handle complexity is to consider that if something looks really big, you get into a helicopter, look at it from five miles below, it's awfully small now. And when you've got a good grasp of the situation, you look at this thing again and you can go down and fix it. There's no other way than to you know, fix the problem. Um, your biggest resources are Joomla, which is actually pretty forgiving. It actually has a lot of stuff that helps you do this. If you, uh, I have this, this, we have this big agency in Belgium that we worked with on a project. And we were talking about a a, 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 a um, non-profit project catalog that they were building in Drupal. And we needed to exchange that information with our system, which is a non-profit online donation service. And they were going to give us the catalog information. So we, we exchanged some information about what fields do you have. Do you have a name, do you have a project code and a country code and stuff like that. So I sent them a document of what we needed. And I went like, well, my guess is that it'll change in the future. And they go like, oh, no, no, man, this is Drupal. You know, we have the CCK kit, it's really good. When we, we change the structure, <laughs> we don't touch it anymore. Uh-uh. <laughs> that is not a good idea, you know. Um, yeah, content structures never change. You, you don't have customers who suddenly decide to buy another business and do apartments, houses, and mobile homes. Um, that never happens, right? I mean, businesses don't change. And then they... they build a new site and they go somewhere else, so what's, what's it to you? Um, stay positive, tap each other's brains. We've got a number of people, and probably a lot of you have, that if you're stuck in a project with something that has to do with a design, a, a navigation issue, talk to other people, but not just for the technical stuff. A lot of the forums um, are about, oh, I need to show this video in this template on this customer, how do I do this? there to ask the questions um, about how do I go about this better? I mean, since yesterday, my, my good example is the guy who showed the admin template 
have the guts to stand up and say, look, I did this. Um, there's got to be a better way. Just what do you think? That's a good attitude to have. I mean, complexity is there for all of us, but I really invite you to share that kind of professional tips and tricks. I mean, none of the stuff I explained is, is, is rocket science. But it really does help. It really addresses issues with problem with customers. Some of these things actually customers taught us. And I'm pretty sure you all have examples that's something as similar as what I talked about with the Excel spreadsheet and stuff that you could say here. So you can ask me a question, but I'm equally interested in hearing similar things that you have, unless Robert tells me that we're totally out of time. No, yeah. Five minutes. <laughs> oh, better four. <laughs> Three. <laughs> so Questions? Or would you recommend like building up your own company mentality? I spent about 18 years in, in, in IT, I mean corporate IT consulting. I've written and read more methodologies than you care to know about. Um, one page, two pages does the job equally well. These are web projects, right? These are not SAP implementations that affect 120,000 users. This is pretty direct. It takes a couple of weeks to build or a couple of months to build a site. Um, just a well thought out plan that says, here's four or five milestones or things we will do. So your customer understands it, you can communicate that, good enough. If you have something that you do over and over again because you have recurring styles of projects, that's great. Every time we do a migration, we write the script. We tell them, we reverse engineer the data. Every time we take over an existing site, we say, we're going to charge you one day for an intake. Send us, give us an FTP access, database access. We're going to reproduce the system here, and we will not start analyzing with you until we got that working here in our environment that we control. That we do over and over again, but not all projects have that step. So uh, as you go along, you'll discover that the stuff that worked last time, you're going to use that again for the next customer. Trevor's build time. Oof. Well, we did one in five weeks. <laughs> um, got some, it, it sort of depends on the project. I mean, like Bike to Work is one that never stops changing. Um, they've got vouchers and some sponsors say, I want, I want my own type of vouchers. Uh, companies say, we want special vouchers from our suppliers for our employees. Um, you know, part of the scalability is functionality scalability. Build time can be anything from Two, th two, three months, uh, calendar time. To first launch, I mean, so say two, three months, you go from intake to first launch -ish. It could be It could be anything from uh, six to eight weeks, which is sort of a minimum. We did the five weeks one, but that was really absolutely crazy. To, uh, we went live with one that is seven months, because in the meantime, the customer decided to change their house style anyway, and then then they had to migrate content and people were lazy and it's not your own lead time that messes it up. It's a lot of gaps that a customer has to fill. But two, three months is, is sort of a logical thing to aim for. Uh, if you cannot do the first go live in six months, you got to chop it into two phases. You got to go for a quick win. It depends on when your customer's politics are important. If somebody needs to show off with that and you want to help that person, do something in three, four months that is a small start, or do a conference room pilot with one division. Uh, we needed to get six different sites in, uh, what was it again? Some simple CMS-like thing um, migrated. So we did a pilot with um, one of the divisions, which was the most anal retentive guy of the, of the pack. Uh, who was hated by everyone, but we knew if we can get him to convert, everybody's going to rush to be ahead of him. And it worked. Once we got him moving. So, two, I mean, a couple of months. Uh. Yes? Well, I'm still here. Um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much.